Well, this one isn't quite as boring as Starlight. That's an improvement, right? But it's not exactly a great reading experience either, as we bounce back and forth between two different romance plots, one filled with cruelty and frustration, and the other filled with melodrama and shallow, rushed relations. Meanwhile, the actual plot moves on at a snail's pace, with the majority of the chapters in this book doing nothing for either the plot of this book or the plot of the latter half of the arc. <sighs> oh well. Let's do this. Twilight was released on August 22nd of 2006, about three and a half months after Starlight. Once again, this is a book written by Cherith Baltry, which is just about the only new thing I can say following Starlight. However, there is something I need to say about Victoria Holmes, who was, as always, making the outline and deciding the plot beats for the book that Cherith was to flesh out. Minor spoiler warning for what I will be telling you in just a couple minutes anyway, but this is the book where Cinderpelt dies. No, it's more than that. This is the book where Cinderpelt is told from the beginning that she will die, and then keeps this a secret for the remainder of the book until she dies, even when Leafpool decides to run away with Crowfeather and leave Thunderclim without a medicine cat to replace her. This is probably the single most powerful element of the book, and whether or not it works or makes sense on a technical level, there is an emotional resonance that I wouldn't feel right skipping over. Without getting into too many details, around the writing of this book, Vicky herself was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and her experiences with that fueled the writing she did for Cinderpelt, embedding in it deep levels of grief, resignation, and grace. It only feels right to acknowledge and respect the meta-explanation here. I wish Victoria Holmes all the best, and I am so glad she's had more time than Cinderpelt ultimately got. And now, I will jump straight into the changes in statistics, so we may quickly move into discussion of the story. In something that may or may not be a mistake, Greystripe is still listed as deputy, despite not being here. And in something that is definitely a mistake, Leafpool is listed as Leafpaw under Cinderpelt, and also as Leafpool in the Apprentice category, somewhere she should no longer be at all. Mousefur has joined the Elder's Den, but Squirrelflen and Spiderleg were promoted, so Thunderclan now has 13 warriors, and Whitepaw is the only remaining apprentice. Fernclad remains the only queen, and Goldenflower and Longtail have been joined by Mousefur in the Elder's Den. The top 10 characters this time have 76% of the lines, tying Midnight for the highest percentage in this arc. And the 41% of She-Cat characters have 62% of the lines, mostly due to Leafpool and Squirrelflight being the two point-of-view characters for this book. With that quickly out of the way, let's get into the plot. Or, uh, what plot there is. The prologue gives us a scene in StarClan where Blue Star, Tall Star, Night Star, and Crooked Star are consoling some cat over the news that their death is approaching, and there is nothing StarClan can do to stop it, or even know exactly when it will come. The cat tells them that they have had a good and fulfilling life, even if it was too short, and they are ready to face what is coming. The StarClan cats promise that they will always be with the mystery cat, and with a solemn heart, they awake beside the moon pool. We then cut to Squirrel Flight and Leafpool discussing Hawkfrost unfavorably, though Leafpool points out that they don't have proof of his wrongdoing. Squirrel Flight backs off, but turns instead to complaining about Brambleclaw taking Hawkfrost's side and everything. Ashford cuts in to call Squirrel Flight over, in the beginning of one of the central relationships to this book. Brambleclaw steps up to lead a patrol to return those two nameless dead Shadow Clan warriors in place of Firestar, and then decides to lead the clan's battle training. While Squirrel Flight comments on how bossy he is, Ashford defends him as a good warrior who could be made deputy. Ashfur is in favor of Brambleclaw. Remember this. Brambleclaw blows up at Squirrelflight for not trusting Hawkfrost for a reason she did not bring up, and Ashfur steps in to say that he isn't being fair, which he isn't. Squirrelflight is worried that she and Brambleclaw will never be friends again with him acting like this. Brambleclaw being self-righteous, pushy, and volatile, and Squirrelflight being mad at this, with Ashfur at her side, is a continuing theme through the remainder of the book along with WingClan being generally upset by ThunderClan's prying, and the note that a Badger family seems to be making its home nearby. But the Bramble Squirrel Ash team drive out the Badger, so I guess we'll never see them again. Leafpool, meanwhile, is spacing out and doing poorly in her duty since her thoughts are consumed with Crowfeather, and fumbling her words as she learns Sorreltail is going to have kits, with Brackenfur. After more Bramble Squirrel Lash feuding, they get into a foxfight and promptly decide this is a great time to march over to WingClan with their injuries to speak with One Star. The new WingClan leader is acting rather cold and distant, and gets upset with Firestar for watching over him like a kit. He declares that WingClan owes nothing to anyone, and that they are just as strong as the other clans, before sending the ThunderClan cats, along with his old friend, out of his territory. Crowfeather and Leafpool each tried to get Squirrelflight to talk to the other about them, but Squirrelflight remains oblivious to their connection. At the gathering, the clans venture across the new tree bridge and onto the island for the first time. 
Every cat spends some time exploring the area first, and Hawkfrost pulls Brambleclaw aside to talk, while Mothwing and Leafpool chat happily with their tails entwined, and Squirrelflight and Ashfur inspect the shoreline. The clans definitively sort out their borders and decide on a new rule that cats will be able to walk across other territories within two fox lengths of the lakeshore to get to gatherings, to the moon pool, or simple visits when necessary. Feathertail gives Leafpool a message for Mothwing, who StarClan cannot reach, and tells her she is happy about her and Crowfeather's budding relationship. Mothwing believes in Leafpool, even if she doesn't believe in StarClan, and accepts the warning. Then there's... more... Bramble Squirrel Ash feuding. And Birchpaw is made Ash for his apprentice. The medicine cats, save her Mothwing and, for some reason, Leafpool, receive a vague set of warning images from StarClan, and Leafpool and Crowfeather decide to meet up in secret at some point. Also, Daisy arrives! She is asking to join ThunderClan with her kits Barry Mouse and Hazel, since Floss's kits were taken by the two legs, and it seems ThunderClan is a safe place. But the decision about her has to wait, because a terrible and unexplained sickness is spreading through RiverClan. Leafpool goes to help Mothwing, calms her down, and is greeted by Reed Whisker, who has to introduce himself since even the characters in the story can't remember who this guy is. Also, it seems like Hawkfrost is still undermining and insulting Mistyfoot. Great. Willowkit leads them to Beachpaw, and, when they find out something is stuck in his throat, manages to skillfully remove the blockage with ease. Seems like she wants to be a medicine cat, and she's pretty good at the job. Unfortunately, her work with RiverClan made Leafpool miss a meeting she had planned with Crowfeather. Meanwhile, ShadowClan is having trouble with those two mean kitty pets, so a patrol of ThunderClan and ShadowClan cats fight them off, and that's done. A couple of side plots happen, one with Cloudtail spending a lot of time with Daisy and Brightheart being jealous, and the other with Brightheart spending a lot of time with Cinderpelt doing medicine cat duties and Leafpool being jealous. Then Leafpool finds out that Brambleclaw and Hawkfrost are training with Tigerstar in their dreams, and decides to do nothing about this. Another gathering happens, with more one-star hostility and the clans getting generally angry at each other, and Crowfeather suggesting that he and Leafpool run away together. Leafpool is hiding her relationship from Squirrel Flight, so I guess that sister telepathy thing really is gone now? And they get in a fight about it. But when Brambleclaw nearly catches Leafpool sneaking away, Squirrel Flight covers for her immediately. Even when there are tensions between them, Squirrel Flight would clearly do a lot for her sister. Squirrel Flight doesn't find out what's happening, but Cinderpelt does, and she is very angry about it. However, Spotted Leaf almost immediately comes to Leafpool in a dream, and tells her both that she should let Brightheart help Cinderpelt, as she has been doing, and that she should follow her heart when it comes to Crowfeather. Leafpool specifically asks if this means she is allowed to run away with him, and Spotted Leaf only answers by fading away with a smile. Leafpool, of course, takes this to mean that she has StarClan's permission, and leaves. Cinderpelt is worried and guilty, but more than anything, she seems drained. Squirrelflight and Brambleclaw also learn about it and journey to WindClan, thinking that's where Leafpool went to be with Crowfeather. But WindClan was under the impression that Crowfeather had gone to ThunderClan. So, despite One Star's reservations, they ally to search for the pair together. However, they don't find them. Brightheart gets frantic about driving Leafpool away by taking over so many Medicine Cat duties, and Squirrelflight takes the moment to wonder if she would run away for either Ashfur or Brambleclaw. She is fairly sure she wouldn't for Ashfur, but is entirely unsure about Brambleclaw. Over with Leafpool, she and Crowfeather spend, I'll be generous and say a day together before meeting Midnight, who tells them that the other badgers they drove out are angry and will attack soon. Crowfeather briefly tries to convince Leafpool to let Midnight warn them, but they quickly agree that they have to go back and help their clans. Various cats in ThunderClan express their sorrow over Leafpool's disappearance, which is promptly cut off by a badger attack, and also Sorreltail having kits. Simultaneously. Everyone is quickly thrown into chaotic fighting. Daisy and her kids escape, and Sutfer dies. Meanwhile, Leafpool tries to give Crowfeather a tearful goodbye, but he decides to come with her to ThunderClan first. They come back and find the fighting already in progress, and Cinderpelt dying, as she was injured while helping Sorreltail with her kidding. Leafpool fights off the badger and promises her mentor she won't leave again. Cinderpelt explains that she knew she would die, and she wasn't going to force Leafpool into any decisions, even knowing that. Crowfeather tells her that he loves her, but her heart and place is with her clan, and they can wait to be together again until they walk in the stars together. Midnight and One Star show up with WindClan to help them win the battle, and Midnight assures them that the Badgers are too weak to consider fighting the clans again. Sorreltail has also had four kits, who will soon be named Honeykit, Poppykit, Molekit, and Cinderkit, after Cinderpelt, who died saving them. Crowfeather is accepted back into WindClan, and the cliffhanger of the century that everyone was waiting for, Stormfur and Brook, appear in ThunderClan's camp. Who the cat in the prologue might be is kept as something of a mystery, but between the clues about them being a medicine cat and being not old, but not young either, the pool is narrowed down substantially. It then becomes clear from hints in her behavior throughout the middle and end sections of the books that it was Cinderpelt, who keeps secret but worries about her impending death. 
Her story is the best part of this book, but not a central part of it. It is subtly developed in the background until her death comes, and gives a great facet to her character. I have no complaints on her end. But as for the rest of the book... Brambleclaw is being a pushy, entitled, patronizing nightmare for the whole book. To Squirrelflight especially, but also every other member of the clan save for Firestar. He calls one star by his warrior name, insults kitty pets in front of Cloudtail and Firestar, and treats every cat like they are bratty apprentices with no competence. Not only is he keeping up and going harder into his camaraderie with and trust in Hawkfrost, but he also starts just insulting Squirrelflight specifically and regularly, demeaning her competence and intelligence with no provocation. Additionally, virtually any time that she tries to spend some free time hanging out with or chatting with Ashfur, Brambleclaw butts in to accuse them of lounging around when they should be working, with the authority of a deputy which he is not. And does he ever apologize for any of this? No. Every cat around him says sorry for the tiniest slip-ups. Birchkit, Squirrelflight, and Ashfur all apologize to him over the book for small mistakes that made him angry. And he doesn't even have the grace to accept these apologies. He simply grimaces, growls, or repeats an order he doesn't have the authority to give in the first place. Whether or not you like Brambleclaw, this book's portrayal of him is of a truly cruel, petty, condescending, and presumptuous cat who has no business even leading a patrol, let alone trying to be deputy. And the fact that this is who he becomes as soon as we lose his point of view is not reassuring. Antagonizing every cat in the clan who even looks at you funny is not at all how any sort of leader should behave. Although, Squirrelflight's other love interest isn't much better, even now. Ashford does defend Squirrelflight whenever Brambleclaw blows up at her unnecessarily, but whenever the topic of Brambleclaw and Hawkfrost come up, or Brambleclaw's general character, Ashford consistently assures Squirrelflight that Brambleclaw is a good and loyal cat, and his relationship with Hawkfrost is fine because it would never cause him to betray his clanmates. This isn't the only issue with him, as, starting very early in the book, Squirrelflight begins to get annoyed by how constantly he speaks for her and coddles her, especially insofar as it surprises her mother. Squirrelflight is entirely capable of and known for standing up for herself, so having to be defended so much and not using her own voice is strange and a bit uncomfortable for her. Although, I would say that she shouldn't need this much defense from herself or anyone else in the first place. Ashford's behavior isn't something that Squirrelflight feels great about, and he doesn't stop even when Squirrelflight expresses her feelings, which is definitely wrong. It is actually this aspect of his relationship with Squirrelflight alone that Brambleclaw takes the time to praise, just for the sake of putting Squirrelflight down even more. Oh, uh, and, uh, well, Ashfur also explicitly insults kitty pets, other clans, and half-clan relationships to Squirrelflight's face when her family and friends cover all three of those categories, so not a great match. In our other perspective, we have Crowfeather and Leafpool, which I believe may be what this book is known for, despite them only sharing a few passing conversations before the sudden decision to leave together in the last five chapters, and the generously measured day they got to spend together before returning and splitting up again. They don't have a bad relationship in the way that Squirrelflight does with her suitors, but they barely have a relationship at all. I have no idea what they see in each other, or what they would be like together if they ever got more than five minutes to talk. All in all, I suppose I'm pretty neutral on them. The last important element to cover is One Star, otherwise known as the fallout from Starlight. From the beginning, he is clearly acting differently than he ever did before he was given his name in Nine Lives. He is notably more firm, cold, closed off from the other clans, and touchy about Wind Clan's strength. All of this is even stronger where Firestar and ThunderClan are concerned, in a move that seems like he is turning his back on his old friend, and the clan that helped to save his life. However, his decision to bring his clan to help ThunderClan with the Badgers in the end, and the way that his guard drops almost completely, shows that it was more of an act than not. He does have to grow strong to be respected as WingClan's leader, and he even shows this strength at the end. But he isn't suddenly a different cat. He remembers his friendship with Firestar, and his goodwill to help ThunderClan when they're in need. This is a good direction to take with someone who was a fairly one-note side character before, and I'm interested to see where they'll take it. As far as the plots of this book go, we have the two romances, One Star's new attitude, Cinderpelt's death, the badger attack, and somewhere in the back, Brambleclaw and Hawkfrost's futures. The supposed main plot of the back half of the arc is the last one, and no progression is made there at all, save for Leafpool now being aware of it, and doing nothing. At least the character stories promise to have ripples outside this book, even if they are in some sense unnecessary, but the badger attack especially has no need to be a plot at all, especially one as large as it was for this book. Leafpool and Crowfeather could have come back for a multitude of reasons, and Cinderpelt could have died due to a multitude of things. The Badgers were never mentioned before and will never be mentioned again. 
Not to mention the other passing side elements like the RiverClan Sickness, the Kitty Pet Attack in ShadowClan, or the Fox Fight in ThunderClan that don't even matter for much of this book. This plot as a whole, therefore, feels like filler, especially in an arc where we've been promised an overarching conflict for two books now, and we have yet to see any progression of it. Despite a couple good elements, I can't help but come away from Twilight with a mixture of anger and annoyance more than anything else. At the chapters upon chapters of wasted time, the random side plots that have no bearing anywhere else in the series, the aggravating relationships and the cheesy ones that were given no time to shine despite the wasted time everywhere else. Thankfully, though, there is only one new prophecy book left, and I will be thrilled to send off the arc in the next episode of our trip through time.